I want to welcome you again to another Table Talk. I am always so grateful to share this week in particular with Reverend Curtis Carmack. And uh, you'll hear more about that uh, at the end of our time together. But today's focus uh, was this little thought. Are we fishers of men or are we keepers of the aquarium? And what I'd like to do is start off with this little analogy. Uh, I didn't use it Sunday because I wanted to wait until today. Uh, but you've got the Sea of Galilee and you've got the Dead Sea joined together by the Jordan River. Now here's the amazing thing. The Sea of Galilee has life. Birds flock from all over Israel and come to the Sea of Galilee. In fact, the picture that we have there gives you the impression of life. Then you have that mighty Jordan River that we hear all about in the uh, scriptures. And then you come to the Dead Sea. And the only way to get out of the Dead Sea is when you evaporate because there's no outflow. Uh, and so it's thick with salt. People can actually float in it. And it just reminds me of that verse of Scripture in John chapter 7, verse 38, where the Bible talks about, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So I'm going to just kind of take that thought and then go to the image that I put up as we started Sunday, Curtis. Uh, that image of the fishbowl, fishers of men or keepers of the aquarium. So let's just start there. From your perspective, not as our student pastor, and not as a newly ordained minister of the gospel, uh, but just as a follower of Christ. Just that image of the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the dramatic difference. Life in one, death in another. This whole concept that out of the heart will flow rivers of living water. What strikes you? Yeah, so I, I wanted to refer back to a passage of scripture that gets at the, at the heart, no pun intended, of this, uh, <laughs> this whole talk, um, this whole subject. And that's in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Yes. And it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And the reality is, um, the closer we draw to the heart of our Savior, the more that we know it intimately, the more compelled we will be to have an outward focus. Because we'll have a desire to reflect more of His character. Right. And the opposite is also true. The further removed we are from the heart of Christ, the greater the tendency is to just think about ourselves, to have an inward focus. Um, but what I wanted to do practically was just reference some passages of Scripture that everybody who's tuning in with us can refer back to. Um, and before we get to those passages, I want to encourage you guys, just like I have to tell myself, to take the lenses off of, of these popular stories you've always heard. Um, these truths that you've kind of Assume that you got the magnitude of. Um, so come to them with an open mind. Absolutely. Okay. Um, because when you do that, you actually see the heart of Jesus and gotcha. what he's really saying. But uh, just a few of those are uh, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And, and what I want you to see in that one is, is Jesus saying, like, I know where you are, but I still love you. In um, Jesus praying at the garden before his crucifixion in uh, Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. See his heart, his, the burden that he carried for the ones Agonized who Agonized in blood. Absolutely. And then the very last one is Jesus' response to his arrest. And all of those that questioned him, that, that kind of authority that he displayed in, in John 18. Um, and come to those texts seeking to see Jesus' heart. Because when you draw closer to that, you will really understand what an outward focus looks like. Amen. Well, one of the things I wanted to go do, is, as you did, is take us back to another text that we used on Sunday, and that's the text in Mark chapter 1. Of course, it's recorded in other places in the Gospels. But this is the calling of the first disciples. And uh, as he's begun to share this whole thought of repent and believe the good news. He sees Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. And Jesus says unto them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And this is what I didn't share Sunday. 
The Bible says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Wow, these fishers, fishermen were willing to leave what they knew familiar to travel with this man they had just met to fish for what must have sounded pretty strange. People. Yeah. So here's what I want to begin to think about. Paul Harvey shared this quote, and I shared it on Sunday, that we've drifted away from being fishers of men to being keepers of the aquarium. And, and I think that what happens is that drifting happens over time. It's very gradual because if it was, if it was abrupt, we would notice that as we do everything else in our life. But gradually, it's kind of like that boiling in the pot of water. It, it, the heat intensifies slowly, so you almost get cozy and uh, have that false sense of security. And, and what I've really noticed is that the longer we walk with the Lord, what we have to guard against is this being more and more entrenched in what I call church culture. What first attracted us, the, the excitement of being on mission, all of a sudden our focus shifts and we begin to be more interested in maintaining. I'm not just talking about maintaining a physical structure. I'm just talking about maintaining the organization as we know it because that feels very comfortable and it's not very threatening. <clears throat> so what I want to do for just a few moments is make this as practical as possible. I want to go back to that image of the BLT sandwich and use those BLT to kind of begin to have some conversation today. First one, build relationships with non-Christians. Build relationships with non-Christians. I tell you what, not just because of refocus. But when I think about the old way in which we used to share the gospel, God on one side, man on the other, and there was this chasm in between. And what filled that chasm? The cross. I am more and more convinced that Christ wants us to truly be bridge builders. You want to talk about that a little bit? About how we can carry that out in everyday life as we look intentionally at building authentic relationships with others? Absolutely. Um, I like that thought, uh, building relationships with non-Christians. Um, so the first thing I would ask is, who do you know? There's this common thing, well, okay, I, I know I'm told to share my faith, but what are, what are the tips and the tricks to getting people to believe? Well, do you know them? If you don't know them, you can't they're, they're not going to care anything about what you're saying. Even if you have the greatest truth that this world has ever known. So do you know them? And, and you know, I didn't share this on Sunday, but that was part of the reason in the 16 years I've been here that we've been praying together, me and Ken and some others on Thursdays. But then we've gone over to Bojangles to hang out there. Uh, and, and I've shared countless times how many people will come to us uh, whether they are, be church people or not, and say, you know what, we didn't realize preachers could have so much fun together. And, and then that sparked some thoughts that on Saturday mornings when I would come up to the church to do various things, I started going by early in the morning and there was this crowd of guys that were always there. And so I just kind of began to invite myself to be a part of that circle. And we haven't done it so much during COVID, but we would kind of sit over there in the corner early in the morning on Saturday and just hang hang out together and get to know one another. And it was really amazing that over time, Curtis, I began to see some of these guys come and I say, Pastor, I'm so glad you're here because I really need to know that someone's praying for me. And they would just begin to pour out their heart. Now, that didn't happen at first. That happened over time. And we would talk about a variety of things. And my wife and others would say, why in the world are you going to Bojangles on Saturday morning? And I don't want to pat myself on the back because I think we all do this to a degree. But I just really saw that as a mission field. And I wanted to build authentic relationships with those that were coming in and being a part of that. Uh, the L, looking for opportunities to talk with your friends about Jesus. And, and one of the things I think is really natural is a lot of us uh, like to walk or like to run. And one of the things that I think more and more people are becoming aware of is this whole concept of prayer walking prayer walking, walking in your neighborhood, not just for your health, but for the well-being of your neighbors. But the sad part is, just like you talked about, few of us really know our neighbors. So I want to share with you something we've been talking about at Maplewood for many, many months. It's called Bless Every Home. It's a ministry resource. If you just Google that, Bless Every Home, you can go online, sign up, it's free of charge, and put in your address. And all of a sudden, it will begin to let you know on a daily basis who your neighbors are. So that as you're walking that street, 
Not only are you just saying, hey, I want to pray for those people that live in that white house. I want to pray for the Carmax. I want to pray for Curtis and Paige. And Lord, I want to pray that you'll begin to give me opportunities to get to know my neighbors. Um, one of the things that Russ Reeves was sharing with us the other day is that's what he does in his neighborhood that he lives at in Greensboro. And he lives next to a guy who apparently doesn't want to get to know a lot of people. And so he kind of is off to himself. And so several days went by, several months went by, and he saw this person there, this lady there, this older person there. So he went over to meet this person. It so happened that this was the mother of the young man who was living there. Russ introduced himself and began to inquire more and more about her son. And through that, began to establish a relationship. So the next time uh, he tells a story of being outside and seeing Matt out in the front yard, he says, hey, Matt, I met your mom the other day. And I'm sure that this guy was kind of strange. How did you know my name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but eventually, here's the neat thing. Eventually, what began to happen was over time, Russ built a relationship. He and his wife were going out of town. He went next door and said, hey, Matt, would you mind putting our garbage cans out to the street tomorrow morning? We're not going to be here. And would you mind putting them back to the house? Sure. That's all he said. He did that again. His wife said, why in the world are you bugging that neighbor? He doesn't have any interest in us. He said, oh, yes, but God's working. And I just want to be obedient. Well, here's the neat thing. One evening at 10 o'clock at night, his door knocked. Or someone knocked on his door. He went to the door, and guess who it was? It was Matt. And Matt said, I need some help. My truck's broken down just before my driveway. He has a huge, big super truck. And uh, he says, I was wondering if you'd help me try to get that in my neighbor, in my uh, driveway so it won't be blocking our neighbors going up and down the road. He said, man, I'll be right there. Now, they didn't get a chance to make it a lot of progress. They ended up having to call a record service to actually move it into the driveway. But Russell was talking about what a blessing it was to know that Matt felt comfortable enough at 10 o'clock at night to come next door and begin to ask of that. So I just want to ask you, what are some ways that you're encouraging our students to look for opportunities to talk to their friends naturally about Christ. Yeah, so one of the first things that we did, <clears throat> um, because as we know that the, the greatest impact that a student uh, will ex experience, if that makes sense, is, is peer on peer. So if something's important to uh, this student and, and they talk about it, then another student will, will be like, man, like, like, tell me more about that. Um, so one of the first things that we started doing to, to have an easy entryway is to have our students uh, read scriptures on Instagram mm -hmm. so that their peers could see that that's something that they care about. Right. But also in hearing scripture, their peers are hearing the truth of the word of God. Um, and from that, just continuing to have conversations with our students each Monday, we call it our Monday check-in, just have, giving them an example of what it looks like to share with them, to care for them, um, so that they can replicate that to their spheres of influence. Um, but just a life on life, do you know them? Mm. I tell you another thing that's going on that I just want to remind our congregation about is we've been having these food boxes and they were food boxes with just fresh produce and now they're food boxes with uh, dairy and meat. And one of the things that's been really neat to me, Curtis, is that the people in our church, and it's not been a large number, but uh, the few who have taken advantage of this have been using those to build bridges. And what's been exciting is to been hear the stories. I, I know for myself, when I took a food box one day to one of our folks in our church, who maybe in many ways people would say, hey, they don't need a food box, but I just felt impressed to take them one. They wept. They literally wept and said, Pastor, how did you know that we needed some of these things? I simply said, I didn't know, but God evidently knew because he impressed me to come and give this to you and drop this off your house. Another thing that I'm looking forward to is that Project Rack wants to deliver some uh, Thanksgiving bags of groceries. Now, they've targeted a couple schools, but then they've asked us as people in our church to begin to think strategically about individuals that we rub shoulders with. And in fact, I think the uh, food packing, if you might say, is going to happen soon. So give us a little update on all of that. Yeah, so, uh, man, I'm so thankful for Project Rack, kind of our outreach um, here at Maplewood. Uh, 
they had it on, our heart, on their heart, like you were just saying, to pack meals, Thanksgiving meals for those who kind of were in need. Um, and this Saturday at 1130 down the fellowship building, they're going to be doing just that. Um, they're going to be packing about 75 bags of groceries. Yeah. And so if you've got a few minutes on Saturday at what time again? 1130. Come yeah. on and be of help with us in that regard. And then uh, Hammerjacks, uh, the new restaurant in town and the old uh, vision center there is going to be wanting to give out meals the Wednesday of Thanksgiving. And these are going to be cooked and packaged meals. And all people have to do is know, uh, just call. I think they want to let them call by the 17th so they can make sure they get the right food. Order. And they'll even deliver that to their home. So I hope that you'll contact Hammerjacks if you like to be involved in that. And then the last one that I want to just take a moment as you think about building, as you think about living it out, is this T. Take your friend to a non-threatening event where they hear the gospel. Now, we're getting ready to host something in just a few weeks that we typically go to. And I'm so grateful that they have chosen not just to cancel it, but to do it over the internet, virtually. Tell us more about the ways in which we can begin to do just that. Take our friends to a non-threatening event where you know they're going to hear the gospel. Yeah, um, so Hearts on Fire is coming up. Uh, this has been a thing that has uh, kind of been the, the, I don't know, just, just a common thing that our, our students do. Uh, we tend, tend to go to Pigeon Forge and, and experience this and, and join in a time together. Uh, but the 20th of November, uh, s- starting here at 6 o'clock, doors open at 6, um, we're going to be hosting this time together. Um, and, and really, just to give them an outline, what they can expect when you come into the doors at 6, you're going to be greeted by people from our church that are just going to love on you and, and welcome you. Uh, you're going to come in here and we're going to have food available um, just so you can have some time to to eat and to get to know other people that you may not know. Um, then we're going to have some like some games where we can have a lighthearted event where you can get to know each other because just walking up to somebody you don't right. know can be intimidating. Right. Um, so having a game where you're kind of forced to get to know each other is always beneficial. Then we'll have some worship. Um, and from 8 to 10, we're going to have Hearts on Fire. Well, the neat thing is I've always seen the Hearts on Fire experience as one of those things our families have really gotten plugged into. In fact, when they go to Gatlinburg, it's not just students who go. Oftentimes, we have as many parents going with their students because they've heard so much from their students about this incredible experience. And so I'm hoping that moms and dads and others who are really in a burden for this generation might be willing to volunteer and come and be a part of this experience because we know the gospel is going to be shared. And what we have to provide is that sense and that atmosphere of safety and security where people can kind of let their guard down and let the Holy Spirit begin to do some incredible work. Well, listen, before I transition to the last two things I want to share, is there anything else from your vantage point in asking this question? Are we fishers of men or keepers of the aquarium that you want to share from your perspective? Yeah, um, just kind of the, the common thought that I've been having is what if... Thinking about an outward focus, how do you live life like that? What if everybody on the street that you see, everybody in your community, um, coming from a Christian perspective, what if they weren't just projects Mm. that you could pat your back for, like reaching out to them? What if you began to see them as who they are? People. As people that Christ came to redeem. The I love that. Ones who, who bear the image of our Savior. Right. Because when they become <clears throat> projects, that's not thinking back of the heart of our Savior. Yeah. Um, no one was ever a project. Right. And there, there is a, um, a perception and a feeling, I think sometimes amongst those in the world, that the church sees the unsaved, the unredeemed, the unchurched as projects. Uh, another notch uh, in pride and, and self-glory. And that's not what we're supposed to be about. Mm. And you were talking about our student and family ministry. Man, that's kind of the drumbeat of everything that we do. 
Uh, your students are not projects of ours. You're not project of ours. We see you as those who have been, uh, that, that Christ came to redeem. Amen. I tell you what, I hope and pray that you'll begin to take some of these things that we've shared. Now, as we wrap up today, I want to just take a moment and express my personal gratitude to you and to your family. I thought we had a great weekend. And in case you missed out on it, we had the opportunity to ordain, set him aside for the ministry of the gospel. Now, the neat thing is this. Curtis is the third person in my ministry since I've been here uh, 16 years. We've had the chance to do that with. The first one was Dale, uh, Daryl Vestal. When he and his family moved over to Forest Hills in Winston-Salem, began to minister there, he wanted to be ordained. Then Jason Klein came and served in our midst, began to serve as a chaplain with hospice, and he wanted to be ordained. And now, here's the neat thing. Those two were fantastic, but in many ways, you've come that full circle. Uh, the whole purpose for us developing the ministry internship was to give you and whoever a safe environment to kind of try out this whole thought of what you felt God was doing. And it's come full circle where we not only have seen, but God has confirmed in you and Paige's heart what he desires. And that is for you to set yourself aside for the gospel ministry. I know you shared your personal gratitude uh, on Sunday afternoon. But in, in some ways, it had to be a little bit overwhelming to take all that in. So you've had a chance to kind of reflect and soak all of it in. Because each and every person that was a part of the service really had been kind of handpicked. They had been people who you felt had touched your life, had poured into your life, uh, who had meant something extremely special to you. So I want to give you just a few moments before I share this closing thought, maybe to share how all this has felt to you and to Paige, and any words of encouragement you'd like to bring now, as I said earlier, as our Reverend Curtis Carmack. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, something I was sharing kind of in our Monday check-in with our students last night um, was like 2020 has been hard for everybody. Um, it's been difficult for me as, as now a pastor. Um, but the really cool thing, the encouragement that I would have to share um, from a kid from Dayton, Ohio, now serving in Yakinville, North Carolina, um, is when God has a promise. Um, he always keeps it. Uh, and as I was sitting there in that chair and many people were coming up to speak, uh, many people that I knew had a great respect for and had just lived a life with, um, the common theme that was going through my head was like, by God's grace, I'm here. By God's grace, I will serve this church. I will walk alongside all of these wonderful people that God has placed in my life. Like, my life is not my own. Mm. Um, and God continues to surprise me, uh, continues to use me despite me. Um, and man, I'm just, just humbled, just grateful, um, and just thankful to God that he still uses and he still chooses. Good words. And, and Curtis, I want you to know that we look forward uh, to these next chapters. And it's certainly our prayer that God might continue to mightily use you and Paige to help kind of steer us and direct us and guide us in our student and family ministry in the months and the years to come. But we'll have to see all that God has in store because part of the ordaining process is to recognize, as we've just talked about today, we have a true outward focus. He has called you unto himself. He's just given you the opportunity to come and share part of that with us during this time. We are so grateful. Well, as I wrap up today, I want to remind all of our folks what happens on Sunday. Our in-gathering of these little boxes, these boxes of joy and love, all wrapped and packed with prayer. So I hope and pray that you'll bring yours with you. We're going to take time in our morning worship service to ingather these and dedicate them unto the Lord because we believe with all of our heart they can help us have that outward focus that truly shares the gospel, the gospel of hope on a journey around this world. Now Sunday we'll be talking about how we network together as the body of Christ and I hope and pray that you'll join us. But again, thank you so much for being a part of this week's Table Talk.